cloud. All right. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Zach Spangler, and I'm an Ag Climate Resiliency Specialist on the Cornell Cooperative Extension Harvest New York team. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here today, um, listening live or listening later. Um, we're going to have a great presentation today from Laura Legnick. But first, I want to take a moment to thank all of the people who helped make this possible. We wouldn't have been able to do it without some great collaborators and, and from a number of different organizations, providing both speakers and organizational support, including the Glenwood Center for Regional Food and Farming, the Ulster County Soil and Water Conservation District, the Orange County Soil and Water Conservation District, New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, and the New York State Soil and Water Conservation Commission, the CC County Associations in Ulster County, Orange County, and Columbia and Green Counties, New York Soil Health, as well as the CC Harvest New York team. Um, so just a quick note on housekeeping, you're most welcome and in fact encouraged to ask, ask some questions in the chat throughout the presentation and, and we'll do our best to get those answered when it makes sense uh, at the end of the presentation or if they are time relevant at a, at a good breaking point. Um, otherwise, we, we do ask that you stay on mute to limit back, background noise. Um, and with no further ado then, I'm very excited to welcome our, our speaker today, Laura Langnick. Laura is an award-winning soil scientist who has worked for more than 30 years to put sustainability values into action as a researcher, policymaker, educator, activist, and farmer. She is a lead author of the USDA's 2015 report on adapting agriculture to climate change, and she regularly leads regenerative climate risk management workshops for farmers and agricultural technical service providers across the US. Her award-winning book, Resilient Agriculture, Cultivating Food Systems for a Changing Climate, was the first and is still the only book exploring climate change, resilience, and the future of food through the adaptation stories of some of America's best farmers and ranchers growing food throughout the United States. She serves as the Director of Agriculture at the Glenwood Center for Regional Food and Farming in Cold Spring. And with that, Laura, you're welcome to share your screen and take it away. Great, thank you, Zach, for, for a great introduction. And I'm, as you're excited to introduce me, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is practical climate risk management. Um, so I will share my screen. And again, I'll just echo uh, Zach's invitation to ask questions. And I think we've, I've scheduled, uh, uh, I've scheduled today, this next hour. So we do have some time to get into questions during the presentation or at the end. So we'll see how that goes, but please do um, ask questions. I'd be happy to answer them. So let's see. All right. I am not a good multitasker, so I'm gonna take a second to do this share and then we will get started. All right. Does that all look like it's working, Zach? Yep, that is perfect. So take the hour today to talk about uh, some of the work that I've been doing over the last decade and that Glenwood has been doing over the last two years uh, around this topic of practical climate risk management. Just before I get started, I want to introduce Glenwood just a little bit. Um, we're a 20 some year old nonprofit based in Cold Spring. Um, we have our own farm and we also, we work both in uh, regional food and farming systems. And the overall mission of the organization is to uh, help bring about equitable and resilient food systems, both, both in the Hudson Valley and in New York region, but also beyond. And we do that through four, we're using four main strategies. We train farmers, we empower change makers, so leaders uh, throughout the food system. We work to develop and support coalitions. Um, again, for change makers within the food system. And finally, we have, uh, we work to provide access to local food for every table. So I'm the director of agriculture. And although I work in all four of these areas in different ways or work in all four of these strategies in different ways, I primarily um, have put, I put most of my effort into the training farmers. So what does climate change mean for farmers? 
I really like this set of three statements because I think it captures what is a very complex um, picture for farmers and all of all the rest of us who, who eat uh, about what kind of really doing to agriculture. So the first is that it's going to get more difficult and expensive to grow food. Also climate stressors. So the you can think of stressors as basically the, um, the way that changing weather patterns creates stress on land, on people and in community will strain relationships between farmers and the communities that they serve. Agricultural landscapes can be a source of climate change solutions. So there's a little bit of dark and light in this particular picture or answer to what does climate change mean for farmers. And in each one of those statements, you can also see the potential for risk and also opportunity. So I'll jump right into, uh, let's remember what risk is. It is a probability or a threat of damage, injury, loss, or any other negative occurrence. And I think when you're thinking about managing risk, I think it's really helpful to, to break it down into these two um, aspects, uh, because then you can begin to think about how to develop a management plan for, for each of these aspects. Uh, and the first aspect is probability. How likely is it that a particular event or negative occurrence um, is likely to happen? And then what are the consequences of that negative occurrence? Or is it relative, relatively minor for your operation or farming operation, or is it catastrophic? So as you can see, there are these two variables, and this is actually what makes uh, climate risk in particular more difficult to manage for because, because climate change or changing weather patterns has increased the uncertainty, that the probability um, quite a bit. And, and so it makes it more difficult to manage. So what is this climate risk? It's basically the additional risk on top of any other um, uh, reason or effect for a negative occurrence. It's the additional risk created by changing weather patterns. So pretty, that's, that's what climate risk is. And what you'll notice is that climate risk is uh, adding to the difficulties, making it more difficult and more expensive to grow food because what it's tending to do is moving probabilities up in this table and moving consequences towards the right. So, so climate risk is essentially increasing both the probability and the consequence of, of some kind of negative occurrence occurring on the farm. And this actually has implications for the way that we traditionally think about agricultural risk. So this is a pretty standard model for ag risk. And what you notice is that there are different types of risk that are in different silos, or I like to think of it as buckets, and that they each contribute to overall farm performance. And traditionally, um, climate risk has shown up most often and it, it, it is it's most discussed as part of production risk. And you may have even heard, as I have, that climate risk is really no different from the kind of weather issues that farmers have always been dealing with. Weather is a common risk in agriculture and really climate change is, is, is not changing the nature of that risk, it's just making it a little more difficult to manage. And I think this is wrong. This is a, a way of thinking about, I, I don't think this is a clear way of thinking about climate risk. And I wanna share a little bit about why I think that. Um, so I think we're 
we're doing farmers a disservice if we continue to perpetuate this myth that climate change effects are primarily a production risk. And the reason is I, I've already mentioned in that opening um, slide, those three, those three um, reasons why climate change is changing agriculture. Remember, it was it's making it more difficult to grow food. It's um, creating stress between farmers and others in their community. Um, and so climate effects are actually touching every part of the farm system. And so this requires that we think beyond managing production risk to think more about the whole farm and all the different ways that climate risk is influencing farm operations. <clears throat> and so complicated. I'll let you actually I'll let you take just a minute to to take a look at this. And then I'm I'll walk through it. So there's a lot here and you can dig into it. Uh, there's a free bulletin, a SARE bulletin online that you can, you can download and take your time with it. And that bulletin goes through every, every element within this diagram. But what this diagram is showing is because of the unique nature, we need to think about managing it differently from traditional agricultural risk. So I'm gonna just walk you through this, this diagram just a little bit, and then we will um, move on to thinking about creating a climate risk management plan. So the first part of this diagram is really uh, describing, explaining the elements, the different elements of climate risk. And I don't, I will not go this day in this presentation, but there, there is a lot here and it is it's useful for farmers and those that support them to take a little time to understand that you can unpack climate risk into these three different qualities or or aspects exposure which is the kinds of weather patterns that are creating um, disturbances on the farm all the effects of specific farm or plant operation in a specific place, and also adaptive capacity, which describes the resilience of the whole farm to um, the exposures and sensitivity. So that, that's, un, that's climate risk unpacked just a little bit. And what I've found over the last decade is it's very helpful when you're thinking practically about how to manage have an understanding of these three different elements. A second aspect of climate risk is, is digging more into this idea of adaptive capacity. And it turns out that in the, the science of ecological, social ecological resilience, there are a lot of very useful ideas that can be applied to agricultural management. Adaptive capacity, which is this uh, whole farm uh, changing patterns, can be broken into or thought about in terms of these three different aspects. Uh, response, which is the ability to design and manage a system to avoid or reduce damage to disturbance and shock. That's response. Recovery is the ability to bounce back at low cost and quickly from when there is damage. And then transformation, the ability to step back and recognize that it's time for a, a major change in production system because of changing conditions. So again, a lot there that uh, is helpful to farmers seeking to manage risk, climate risk, and also those that support them to understand and develop effective risk management strategies. 
And then the final part of this diagram is, is laying out a set of tools that we know are, are specifically valuable when you're managing climate risk. In this particular bulletin, we call it a climate resilience toolbox. And what I want to focus on today is actually whole farm planning, that first bullet, which is an important climate toolbox. I want to I'll focus on whole farm planning for climate risk management. So I know that was a lot. Um, if you have a question, a specific question about this framework, climate risk framework, um, please put that in the chat. I'll give you a minute just to think about that. Okay, hearing none, I shall move on. So I have worked over the last decade um, and with the help of many farmers and ranchers around the country to develop a fairly straightforward planning um, approach to creating a climate risk management plan. And the five steps, and I'll move through them uh, with the in the remainder of this, this presentation. The five steps are goals and resources, uh, determining what your goals and resources are, what is your climate risk, what adaptive strategies are available to you to, re to reduce that risk or manage that risk, what are the best fit options for your farm in your place, and then how do you measure farm performance? So I just want to walk, walk through these steps. So first, um, what are your farm goals and resources? So it turns out that because climate risk touches the whole farm, it's important to think about how climate risk influences the whole farm in, and also the farm family. And in, when I use family in this context, I'm meaning the group of people who depend on the farm, who, who feel connected to the farm, who love the farm, and who have some kind of decision uh, making uh, responsibility for the farm. The other thing you'll notice is that community is also included in this thinking about farm goals and resources. The way I like to think about this is that the farmer stands kind of on that boundary of, of farm and family. They're looking into the farm and in the center of that farm, when we're thinking about it in terms of risk management, you notice those very traditional uh, buckets of risk are still in there. So we're still thinking uh, about uh, agricultural risk in this case in a traditional way, but we're adding additional thinking to the process. So the farmer's looking in at the farm uh, from the farm family, but also part of uh, managing climate risk successfully is also taking the time to look outward into community and look at what the resources, your own internal goals are, but also what resources are available to you to manage the risk. We're, we're doing this work at Glenwood. And so what I thought I would do with each step is just share a little bit about how we're doing climate risk management at Glenwood's farm in Cold Spring. So it turns out that one of the most useful approaches to developing uh, your goals or expressing your goals and um, reviewing resources available for climate risk management is actually a, a specific type of whole farm management called holistic management. And we have, we have the good fortune in the U.S. of having two organizations that have been working for many years, uh, 15 to 20 years, to develop holistic management practices for um, farming systems, farm and ranch systems in the US. And these two organizations are the Savory Institute and also the Holistic Management International. 
And what I just want to point out with this slide is that holistic management actually has some very specific techniques and also or practices and also tools involved in managing for whole farm the uh, well-being and at glenwood if, if you take a look at the the list on the right you see that um, we've got five practices or actually i guess six sorry i can't see the bottom let's see Um, yeah, six practices. And at Glenwood, we have been working, we have done practice one, we've done inventory of our farm. We have also created a mission statement and developed a holistic goal, a three part holistic goal, uh, which involves describing the quality of life and the value and what we value, uh, describing how we need to behave and what kinds of systems we need to put in place to maintain that quality of life, and then also our vision for the future. So, so uh, we, we've started working with holistic management practices at Glenwood as part of our climate risk management plan. So what's the plan what is your climate risk and what I've what I've listed here are some typical climate risks uh, that have been reported by farmers in the Northeast in particular although these risks have influenced uh, our influenced farming and ranching all over the country the the primary risk that are reported in the Northeast is water too much and not enough and I know anyone who's listening who's a farmer uh, in the Northeast understands the challenges. And this is also the biggest challenge we have at Glenwood Farm. Some other climate risks, specific weather events that are affecting uh, farm management and the success of farms, uh, more variable temperatures and rainfall, warmer winters, warmer nights, more frequent and intense heat waves, more pest and disease pressures, and in particular, um, higher populations of uh, traditional pests, but also the, the um, coming to different areas of novel pests, pests that have never been seen before in, in your area. And then also um, disruption of pollination and fruiting. So at Glenwood, as I said, um, too much and not enough water is a main climate risk. And I just want to share a few images. Um, these are from November 2021. Um, we had a very wet fall last in uh, November in that season. And you can see the results of that. Lots of surface water runoff, lots of uh, soil erosion and um, major damage to our roads. Um, during that that fall season, the early fall hurricane that came through, um, and then last summer, as I know many many of you in the Hudson Valley experienced, we had a, a fairly extreme heat uh, drought and accompanied by heat waves last summer. So this would be summer 2022. Um, and you can see when I look at the picture, that top picture, what I'm noticing in the foreground, you've, you've got a, what looks like a, a, just a field that's been prepared for planting, but actually that field had been seeded two months before with a, a summer cover crop, a mixed cover crop. And it was just so dry that it never actually um, emerged from the soil. If I look a little farther back into that landscape, what I notice is the um, over, you see the shade structures on the right hand side, and that was a pasture that had completely gone brown. Um, you can see in the, on the right hand side below, that's a close up of that pasture, um, had completely um, gone dormant 
during this drought. And then if you look a little further across Glenwood's landscape, I, I, what I, my eye always is drawn to is the, um, the forest, the way that the trees in the forest were beginning to go dormant as well. It was a pretty serious drought. Um, we, for the first time in the uh, known history of Glenwood, we actually had a well go, one of our three wells went dry and we have a pond and a lake that we uh, get out of and those ponds dropped more than uh, four inches, which had never happened um, during the, in, in the current history of, of the, the farmers that are there. So pretty serious drought. We're very lucky that we do have a well um, developed irrigation system uh, for our vegetable operation, but, but no, no irrigation for our livestock operation. The last thing I want to, to show or, or speak to is that if you notice in the middle ground of the, um, of the landscape picture, that area is still fairly green. And we have several unmanaged areas, we call them thickets, um, that are, are a mix of um, different kinds of plants, including some invasives, but also some useful native and adapted species. And during this drought, we were able to shelter our livestock, our pigs and our, our cattle um, in these little bit cooler, little bit wetter, um, still stayed green areas on our farm that are natural drainages. Um, and that was really useful. So we, we really took notice of both how our pastures responded to this extreme drought, um, how our cultivated fields responded, and then also how useful these thickets were. So the third step in uh, managing or in developing a climate risk plan is to ask this question, what is your adaptive strategy? So one of the real benefits of applying social ecological resilience thinking to agricultural management is that there are a number of um, frameworks, ideas, um, ways of thinking about managing systems that are very useful uh, applied to farming. And so this is just one of those ways of thinking or frameworks for thinking, uh, frameworks for decision-making. And it's called the adaptive strategy. And very simply explained, it turns out that we, where there are different ways to approach managing risk in, a, in this case, a farm system. And the first, uh, strategy, there's a bucket of practices that fit within this first strategy of uh, protect. And the basic idea here is that you're not trying to change any of the elements, the, um, the mix of crops, livestock, landscape, uh, labor, the, none of, you're not changing any of those aspects or elements of the farming system you're just adding practices to protect that system. You can think of this strategy as targeting specific threats. And this, for example, uh, if drought is an increased issue, um, that would be the threat. And a specific protect practice would be to add irrigation. So, these kinds of protect strategies are the most commonly used in agriculture, in traditional agricultural risk management. And I think if you just think through that a little bit, you can, each of you could come up with examples. A specific pest requires a specific kind of chemical um, to manage or, or uh, just a disease um, and and so on. Uh, we can certainly talk about that some more if you're interested in digging into that a little bit more. So protect strategies don't change the relationships in the farming system. They just typically add 
uh, practices to protect the existing farming system. ADAPT strategies take a different approach. With ADAPT strategies, you're beginning to, to change some of the um, elements of the farm system, the specific crops, these, the ways that you manage crop and livestock, and th these changes are taken to achieve greater functional and response diversity. And functional response diversity in this context has a very specific meaning. So it's much more than just let's increase biodiversity and that's good. It's really digging into how we can design and manage biodiversity for very specific goals. Um, functional diversity speaks to the ability of the farming system to meet its own needs through providing different functions um, ecologic by creating or creating the opportunity for different ecological functions. So a function might be, for example, crop nutrition. So in the ADAPT strategy, we're thinking about how can we provide crop nutrition, for example, uh, in a crop rotation or adding um, cover crops that are providing nitrogen, so legume cover crops in a, a crop rotation that's then providing nitrogen for the following cash crop. So that's an example of functional diversity. Um, response diversity is a very different kind of diversity. And the goal of, of design and management for response diversity is to maintain those functions over a wide range of conditions. There's really a lot in this uh, bucket uh, of ideas and um, potential practices. And again, it's a lot to think about, and I really encourage you to dig in this dig into this a little bit as well. So that's ADAPT strategies. It's basically, they're, they're, they're strategies that look to the potential for the agro ecosystem or the ecological processes within a farming system to um, help to reduce climate risk. And the third bucket is the transform bucket. And this is basically the goal of these sets of practices are to transition the farming system into a new system. So these are fundamental changes into a new system that is more um, resilient, able to respond and recover uh, more quickly and at low cost to changing conditions. So this is adaptive strategy, protect, adapt, transform. What um, I've learned from working with farmers over the last, uh, working with resilient farmers over the last decade is that, that all three practices are important and that depending on the specific risk and the overall goals of the farm, farmers, will, farmers and ranchers will um, take practices from each of these strategies to enhance the well-being of their farm, even as conditions change. So as I mentioned, I've been working a bit, um, over the last decade with farmers from all over the country. Um, and I've been one of the questions that I've been asking in this work is how do diversified farmers manage climate risk? And at this stage in the in work, I have done um, multiple in-depth interviews and developed case studies for about 45. Um, leading farmers from around the country, growing food um, all, all over the country, and all of them using, I, th I think, the best label to describe their farming philosophy, at least the best label for me would be ecological farming, um, diversified farmers, farming works for me too, but other labels that, that these farmers use um, for themselves to describe their philosophies include regenerative, organic, biodynamic, sustainable, and climate smart. So a lot of what, what I've shared with you today has been what these farmers have taught me as I've worked with them to understand and adapt um, 
social ecological resilience science to the challenge of adapting U.S. agriculture to climate change. So as we at Glenwood were thinking about our adaptive strategy, we were able to draw from this and other resources from the, my own work and also other resources to begin to think about what mix of adaptive strategies would work best at Glenwood to manage this problem we have of too much and not enough water. And as we looked at, at my work, but also other work, um, what, we, what we learned was that top risk management practices, climate risk management practices um, of diversified farmers include these, managing for soil health, planned biodiversity, and remember that planned biodiversity really fits in that middle bucket, that adapt bucket, because it turns out that diversified farmers are uh, really thinking about enhancing functional and response diversity on their farms as a, uh, a way to manage climate risk. These farmers also tend to market in diverse High, uh, tend to sell into diverse high value. Um, there, they've also there's been a lot of focus on improving water management, um, and in many cases, these farms are who which never needed drainage and irrigation. They're actually adding both. There's been a lot of uh, work and development and innovation around physical protection of crops and livestock and also um, more emphasis on creating recovery reserves. And so these are reserves that are held in the case of damage or some kind of disturbance creating damage on the farm to allow for a swift and low cost recovery. So we first took a look at, at what kinds of adaptive strategies and the practices at Glenwood. We first took a look at, at looking at these different adaptive strategies and which practices worked, seemed to be the best options for us. Um, and then we began to hone them down. So that's the fourth step of this five-step process of creating a climate risk management plan is now we've we've gone out and looked at the landscape of possibilities for managing in this case too much and not enough water and now we're honing down the options to find those that fit best for our farm and so i want to talk about just two cases we found particularly valuable two case studies from my work um, that we found particularly valuable in helping us think through the best options. And I want to just share a little bit with you uh, about these two case studies. So the first is um, Gem, and Adele, Gem and Adele Hayes. They own Setbush Hollow Farm. They manage it with their children. Um, and they're based in Warnerville, New York. They're in the Schoharie, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, Schoharie Valley. And um, they were noticing uh, increasing heavy rains, heavier winds, strong storms, and also increasingly frequent power um, and road or, or transport disruptions. Um, in particular, they, when I interviewed them about climate risk and how they were managing it, they referred back to damage from an intense storm, very extreme storm. Uh, it was back-to-back -back hurricanes in 2011 from Irene and Lee. And I'm sorry I neglected to point out that they have a 160-acre farm. They are a diversified, pasture-based livestock operation with uh, sheep and layers and broilers, beef and pork. And so, as I said, they, when, when they were thinking through climate risk and how they were managing it, they referred back to, to catastrophic damage from these back-to-back -back, um, hurricanes in 2011. As they put it, reset our thinking in lots of ways. And so, among the changes they made, um, or were in the process of making, um, 
when Irene and Lee hit, they had been adding drainage to the farm to manage heavier rainfalls and surface water flows. They added water catchment to manage um, more frequent dry periods and droughts to allow them to be able to water their animals. Um, they reinforced all their field shelters where they, they grow their, their poultry. Um, they added additional feed storage, which is a type of recovery reserve, um, added additional pasture and also solar backup power. Another farm that, that we um, learned a lot from was the a fair share farm. They're, they're not in the Hudson Valley or in, in New York, but they're, they're based in uh, Missouri. But so this farm that really resonated with our own challenges, um, we, learned, we took a lot from their case study. It gave us a lot of, of thinking about how to hone which practices were best fit for our operation. Um, their challenge, their climate risks, their greatest climate risk challenges were um, heavy rains, more variable spring and fall weather, and also heat wave. And Rebecca and Tom uh, from Fair Share Farm, they manage 10 acres of diversified vegetables, fruits, culinary herbs. They have 100 laying hens, and they do some on-farm growing vegetables and, and uh, processing vegetable ferments on the farm. And some of the changes that they made to reduce climate risk to the farm include adding a passive solar greenhouse, adding uh, solar power production on the farm, uh, shifting their irrigation system to solar powered irrigation. They also purchased an electric utility vehicle and retrofitted their cultivating tractor to run on solar power. Um, one thing I the the thing I want to focus on that has informed climate risk management at Glenwood, however, is uh, work they're doing with a type of surface water management system that is called Masterline, and it is also um, it's a type of keyline design, but it's keyline design for wet environments. Keyline was developed for dry environments. And so this is a picture of Fair Share Farm, and notice the their their um, you can see the URL for the farm fairsharefarm.com is is there. Um, you can get lots more information about their master lining work and about how it's working um, from directly from their website. But what is master line? So this is an aerial photo of Fair Share Farm, and one of the um, Big challenges of this this original layout was after heavy rain. The picture below, the bottom picture shows you what their fields looked like. Very difficult for them to manage diversified vegetable production with that kind of uh, poor surface water flow, and and also this water would sit around. This really spoke to us at Glenwood because this is what our much of our vegetable ground looks like after a heavy rain. <clears throat> what is master line? So this is fair turf farm after master lining. And very simply, master lining involves changing the orientation of your, um, your rows and also adding berms between, adding swales and berms between your rows of uh, your vegetable rows in this case, in order to slow down uh, and spread out water more evenly across the landscape um, as a way to reduce, to, to um, speed up surface water drainage after a heavy rain and also to spread out water to drier parts of the farm. And so those bottom images um, are showing you after the, the master lining, um, after a very heavy rain, and then six hours later after that rain. So you can see that, and this was the first year after the master lining was put into place. Um, 
and you can see already there there's been improvement in water in the drainage after heavy rain and also um, tom and rebecca um, expect that as this system uh, that, that, that uh, it will actually improve water drainage off the farm so we've decided at Glenwood that we are going to give master lining a try. So watch this space and we'll let you know how it goes. Uh, we've also engaged Tom and Rebecca to be uh, um, at distance consultants to help us design and then also uh, work with us through master line at, at Glenwood. So step five, it, the last step in developing a climate risk management plan is to monitor farm performance. This is a particularly important step because of the uncertainty and variability uh, associated with changing climate conditions. So how do you monitor farm performance? You basically choose um, metric or ways to measure different aspects of the farm. Because we're thinking about whole farm and climate climate uh, risk of the, at, of the whole farm, uh, it's important that you think of measuring not just perhaps reduction in cost or increase in revenues, but also uh, measures of performance like fam farm family well-being, ecological well-being, community well-being, and so the farm team at Glenwood, this is this is uh, the step we're in now in our climate risk climate risk management planning. Um, we are beginning to explore how we're going to measure the uh, performance of the the changes we're going to make in the farm this year in more variable weather and extremes. So just to sum up again. There are five steps to whole farm climate risk management. To answer these questions, what are your farm goals? What is your climate risk? What adaptive strategies work best for your farm? What are best fit options within each of those strategies? And how are you gonna measure um, the change in farm performance as you implement these new options to reduce climate risk? I just want to letting you know that there there are not a lot of resources I think yet on how to for farmers to um, do this kind of whole farm climate risk management, but there are some, and I wanted to share just a few of, of these examples. Um, Nofa New York or Nofa put out a great little guide, although it's written for organic farmers. I think it's useful farmer interested or anyone that supports farmers interested in learning more about whole farm planning this whole farm approach climate risk management um, there's also some great traditional agricultural risk management guides out there in particular this one um, includes climate risk in the discussion of risk management Another great resource is for agriculture. It's a USDA bulletin um, that includes essentially a whole farm approach to climate risk management. But its particular value, I think, is it sets up uh, adaptation options or climate risk management options um, uh, as a set of menu options, there are eight menu options, and with each, within each option, there are ten, uh, many, many, many specific practices within each of those menus. So very useful, just if nothing else, as a guide to jog your thinking a little bit to broaden your thinking about what practices might work for managing the specific risks on your farm. Um, down at the left bottom, uh, we have the good fortune in New York of having a climate smart farming program. And so you can go to the website and get lots of great resources for thinking through managing climate risk. Uh, watch this space at Glenwood is 
will, by the end of, of this year, we will have published our uh, five steps to your whole farm climate resilience plan. It, it, it's a do-it-yourself workbook for farmers, um, which will be available as a, a free download online. And we also plan to um, publish some hard copies. And I already mentioned the SARA Bulletin, Cultivating Climate Resilience on Farms and Ranches. But again, remember that's where the um, climate risk diagram that I walked through in the early part of the presentation, you can find that there along with lots of discussion about many of the um, topics that I've discussed today. And finally, I'm very pleased to let you know that the second edition of Resil my book, Resilient systems for a changing climate was released last year and uh, in that book you can also learn more about all of these these ideas around um, climate risk management and also managing farms and ranches for resilience and it includes um, excerpts from many of the from those four stories and case studies of those 45 farmers that I mentioned earlier. So I'll stop the share and find out if there are any questions or comments. Let's have a little bit of a discussion about Absolutely. climate risk management. Yeah, wow, Laura, that was really informative. I really loved your uh, blend of, you know, kind of theoretical procedural as well as very hands-on practices people can try out and dive into. Really appreciate all of that. Um, Everybody else, I welcome you to raise your hand, put something in the chat. If you do have questions, comments, discussion sounds great. Um, while you're thinking of that, I can kick it off with, with one thing that was uh, in my mind as you were talking about the masterline planning work, because those are really powerful pictures. How well would that work or how easy would that be to implement at a much larger scale, right? 10 acres, fairly manageable, but you get up to 100, 200 acres, they still have the similar issues. How well would that work? I think at that scale, so Masterline is a technique that was developed by Mark Shepard. He's a agro, he, he has an agroforestry farm. He, he basically transformed a, a standard Midwest corn and soybean farms. And I, I believe the scale was 150 acres. And he, in the process of transforming that farm into um, an agroforestry farm, He's, he grows a very diverse mix of both annual and perennial crops and livestock on that farm. But he, he developed the, this a little bit different take on key, uh, key line design, which he eventually called master line. And, and he, had to, he felt that he had to adjust it because, uh, or tweak key lining because it had been developed for dry environment and and he was in he's in wisconsin a very wet environment so i uh, just to short answer your question i think it would work mm -hmm. i don't think it's scale limited except perhaps in the cost mm -hmm. of managing it of, of, of implementing it but it's also not that different in my view from more traditional water management structures that that are typical conservation practices that get, are eligible for cost share. So um, great question. I would love to see some research and, and maybe some case study um, to answer that question a little better. Yeah. So we do have a question in the chat from Jenna asking, are there any good tools out there for measuring farm performance related to climate risk on small and medium scale farms? There are lots of great tools and I didn't make much of it, but the um, the bar graphs I was, it, when I mentioned briefly, farm perform, measuring farm performance, um, that is from, some research that I was involved in in the Southern Appalachians with small and mid scale, we called it at that time sustainable farms. And we developed a, a guide actually with something like, mm, I don't know, maybe 40 or 50 metrics that we tested with a group of 25 small and mid scale diverse bed farmers in the Southern Appalachians. Um, so that's available, but also 
um, many other, let's, we could call them sustainability metric sets are out there. And um, Jenna, I'd be really happy to share some of those resources with you. They're also listed in our five steps guide because that fifth step is developing a measure, a way to measure. And so in the five steps guide, we include um, a number of resources to just get people started thinking about metrics. Great. Um, keep those questions coming in the chat. Uh, and I, I, it would, I think it would be great to see that paper. I think that's something people are always looking for is how do I how do I measure my my success beyond just you know dollars and cents? Of course, that is what matters probably the most to make having a profitable farm enterprise. But we, we do want to look beyond that and make sure that we're you know, ready for the future, happy, healthy, whole individuals as well. You know, it occurs to me I could put the link to the five steps guide in the chat. I don't know. Does that make sense? Let me. Let me if I you know want to put I, it in, in the chat, I can also share it with the recording later if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's fine. Why don't we do that instead? Because okay. I just we're we're running out of time, and I am, as I said, I'm not a good multitasker. So, <laughs> yeah, but I'll make sure I send it to you. Another question from Jenna in the chat: Have you seen a lot of solar backup power being installed on farms in the Hudson Valley? I I don't feel that I can answer that. I haven't really looked at that question in that way. Um, I don't know, is anybody else online that, that's here have any good grasp of what's going on with solar backup power in the Hudson Valley? I just haven't thought about it that way. So um, although one of my case studies that I shared, they, they did that. I don't know how, how common that is. I've seen a couple farms transitioning to solar powered irrigation pumps. But I haven't yes. seen large scale, not large scale, but like farm wide solar backup. But I don't yeah. see why not. It sounds like a great idea. It it all comes down to cost and benefits, doesn't it? Right. <laughs> right. How reliable is your grid power versus how much does that cost? Versus yeah. how critical is the grid power to your to your operation? Wow. Yeah, exactly. Well, Laura, we're, we are running close on time. Do you want to tell us what's up next in the series? Happy to. Um, and what a great segue thinking about solar. Um, so in two weeks, uh, I will return and um, I'll be bringing with me some farmers, our two Glenwood farmers, and also um, Kyle Nysinger, who is a farmer at Maple View Farm. And we will be talking about a climate, the climate battery greenhouses. Uh, Glenwood just worked with, Glenwood just built one this, this last year and um, Kyle was helpful to us. He built one the year before. So we'll be just talking about why we built, why we were interested in climate battery greenhouses and um, what it was like to build them and how well they're working. Um, and if you want to know more about climate battery, what what should I say? Just to so what is a climate what is a climate battery greenhouse? It is essentially a greenhouse that you're you're um, it's got assisted heating and cooling from the soil underneath the greenhouse. Maybe that's the best way to to put it. Um, so that there's there's a system in place in a climate battery greenhouse that allows you to store heat excess heat from the house in the ground and also to um, store excess cool from the um, in the ground so uh, really we're really interested at Glenwood to see how well this works and uh, I think you'll find it an interesting webinar so I hope you join us I'm really looking forward to that that'll be Friday March 10th at noon and I hope I hope we'll see you all there unless there's any other questions for today Great. Thank you so much, Laura. Have, have a great rest of your day, everyone. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Zach.